Well, hello everyone. Welcome to program seven of the Task of Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. Thanks for taking time today to attend this session. We really appreciate that you care about water quality. I'm Brian Whittemore. I'll be your host for today's program. A Task of Waters is a local nonprofit that has been active in Atasca County since 2009. If you haven't done so, you can check out our many accomplishments on our website, ataskawaters.org, where you can also access a treasure trove of clean water practices. But in brief, our goal has been to find grants to do research on local water quality and to do educational events such as this to share that knowledge. We have had an outstanding lineup of speakers so far this year. You can find a video recording of all those programs on our website, ataskawaters.org. We look forward in November to the last of our 2002 program series. That program will be at noon on the first Thursday of November, the third, and you can register through our website, ataskawaters.org. Also, if you have a topic that you would like us to cover in 2023, please let us know. We thank our partners for making these events possible, the Grand Rapids Area Community Foundation Fund, Minnesota Sea Grant, Atasca Soil and Water Conservation District, Atasca Coalition of Lake Associations, Rapids Radio, and KAXE KBXE Radio, and of course, the Blandon Foundation. Hosting the question and answer session today, uh, the section rather, will be Atasca Waters board member and manager of the Atasca County AIS program, the one and only Bill Granges. Here is how our program today will work. Our speaker will discuss the science behind the topic and then give you some strategies and actions that you can use to help mitigate any issues that you might have. That will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions. To ask questions, simply click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type a brief question into the dialog box. You can do that at any time during our speaker's presentation and Bill will read those questions to our speaker during the Q&A section. Similar questions may be combined and just so you know, we may not get to all the questions if we run out of time. This program is being recorded and will be available soon for viewing online through our website, ataskawaters.org. And finally, we value your opinion and hope you will complete the evaluation form that will be sent to you via email after today's session or keep your phone handy. And at the end of today's program, we will have a link on the screen for you to easily submit your evaluation. Our topic today is land use and forestry impacts on water. And our speaker today has an outstanding resume. Dr. Diana Carwin is an associate professor at the U of M Department of Forest Resources an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Soil, Water and Climate and an associate in the Institute on the Environment. She received her PhD from the Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Dr. Carwin's research and teaching focus on hydrology and watershed, physical and chemical processes. More specifically, she investigates how variations in climate, landscapes, and land use drive physical, chemical, and ecological transport processes in watersheds, with emphasis on the movement of fine suspended sediments, associated contaminants, and particulate organic material. Her approach strongly relies on field sampling and field scale experiments, laboratory analyses, and numerical and statistical models. To this end, she employs a series of hydrologic, geochemical, and statistical tools to track watershed processes. However, for the next hour, Dr. Carwin is all ours. So Diana, welcome to Atasca Water's Practical Water Wisdom Series. The stage is yours. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and thanks to the group at Itasca Waters for extending this uh, chance for me to speak with you today. Um, and thanks for that great introduction. And thank you to all of the participants who have joined to kind of come on this, this watershed journey with me and think about water in the North Woods in Minnesota. There we go. We're going to be talking about watershed connections. And so I kind of want you all. I'm going to use a lot of images and pictures and a few movies throughout our time together here today 
But I want you to also think about your experience and your experience being in a stream or river and to think about how that whole watershed, and we'll talk about what that means, comes together to form that stream or river. Um, and so I'll use a lot of images where we're looking at a stream or river, but also keeping in mind the landscape around them and how that works together. So I like to make this analogy. We see the, the Temperance River here on the right-hand side of the screen in this cartoon um, on the left. Many of us go and see a doctor and get a checkup um, at certain times throughout the year. And as a course of that, they take blood for me. They often take blood from my arm and they put blood into different containers and those containers go to the lab and we get some data on what's in my blood. And the doctor uses that to infer how my whole body as one system is functioning um, from these blood vials taken from one place in my body. That's the approach that I and a lot of um, folks I'm, I'm happy to work with take to thinking about our watersheds as one entire entity. So instead of just saying, what's the blood type, what's the blood color, what's in the river water, colleagues such as Dr. Lucy Rose that works closely with me and myself think about water as having lots of chemistry in it. And we can sample and get all different kinds of analysis on that chemistry to tell us about the water quality and how that whole watershed ecosystem is functioning. And so speaking with Itasca Waters and having this lens, thinking about North Central and Northeastern Minnesota, what we notice is the, the land cover map of the state kind of in the center of the screen and thinking about uh, this area with the red arrow pointing to it, which is a research forest in Itasca County. A lot of data has been developed there um, over several years. We're starting to expand that out. But also if we look generally at those green forested areas of the state, those are the areas that um, the Minnesota DNR and Department of Environmental Quality have mapped out to have higher surface water quality associated with them. So forests in Minnesota have been long time associated with higher quality water in streams, rivers, lakes. This is not just in Minnesota and there's like kind of a very good association behind this and recognizing the value of forested lands for providing not just clean surface waters, but providing clean and safe drinking waters. Um, recently put out by um, a group at the USDA Forest Service, they've done an analysis on what is the importance and what is the value nationwide in the US in terms of forests and grasslands for providing drinking water. Um, and what they have come up with is there's about 99% of people on public water systems somehow there's forested lands as a part of the generation for that water supply. So it's a really tight, important association ecologically and, and societally. I'm using this term watershed as my sort of analog for an entire system or an entire organism. And it's really important in Northern Minnesota to think about what that means. And so kind of by the textbook definition, a watershed is a land surface area from which all water and anything in the water drains to a point, either on a stream, a river, or say within a lake. And so this definition is really tightly coupled to the land surface topography. So you could think about it like a basin. If we're pouring water into one edge of the basin, it would all fall and funnel along kind of land surface gradient to this point on the stream. In Minnesota, we have these uh, really special areas, especially in North Central Minnesota, where we have water that leaves our state going in three very different directions. So Northern and North Central Minnesota has parts of the headwaters of the Mississippi River that drains to the Gulf of Mexico. Drainage that goes mostly through the St. Louis River and the North Shore that's going to the Great Lakes and, and out to the Atlantic Ocean that way. And then in the North and Northwest part of the state, we send water North um, to Canada and up to the Arctic Ocean. And so all of these divides, these continental divides that are put into place 
for the watersheds are solely based on land surface topography. And what I, um, there's a great article from uh, August of 2020 that I'm referencing here in the Star Tribune that puts this all together that um, I think is just fun. If you're interested in it, I'm happy to share it later. But when we're in parts of North Central Minnesota on the ground, we're looking at systems where sometimes it can be hard to see that topographic divide because the landscape looks very flat and we can see or maybe stand in or somehow otherwise be on these wetlands. And so as we're thinking about how our streams and rivers kind of generate and link to the landscape, I really want us to think about not just the top of the landscape, but really everything that's underneath it. And we're going to talk about how what's making up that landscape from the surface below, such as soils, wetlands, help generate what's in that river and stream. And so in this way, we're not just thinking about water running over the land, say, you know, pouring and having it run across the surface. Many of us may have seen this on a paved surface, a road, our driveway, um, something like this, but also thinking about water running beneath the land in terms of groundwaters or infiltration that makes it to aquifer recharge and also thinking about water running through the land. So how is that water connected from these wetlands and the landscape to the streams and rivers? <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a headwater stream where we see a tiny of water forming a headwater stream pouring over a structure that we use to measure it. And what you might happen to notice is that this water has a brown tinge to it. I actually realized I have samples of this water that I could show you today here on the here on the zoom. And so what you notice is this water that's coming actually out of this weir right here has a brown tinge to it. This is colored by the wetland that that water flows through. There is um, some may call it tannins. The broader term is dissolved organic matter that when we compare this to drinking water coming out of a water fountain, we can really see the color difference. And so the water that runs through the landscape and forms the start of these streams and rivers is ultimately tied to what it flows through. And it bears the chemical signature or the flavor per se of what it's come into contact with. And so one of the questions that really motivates me to think about this watershed function is to think about how the landscape contributes water to streams and rivers. Does that contribution differ with season, with storm cycle, with landscape management such as forest management or forest disturbances that can happen? And one of the ways we go about this is to look at long-term monitoring data as well as instrument other sites. So we're gonna take a little bit of a snapshot and a little bit of a field tour, excuse me, to an area where I have, a, have had the good fortune um, with my research colleagues to be able to work for a handful of years um, in work that was actually funded by the Minnesota LCCMR. And so this is an area, um, you can see here snapshots through the seasons. We're working in the West Swan River um, in an area surrounded by managed forest. We use a series of uh, techniques and monitoring equipment that's put in place where we're looking sort of at the stream and river that you can see here in the pan panoramic shot across the top, where we have a river that's about, you know, in the summer we can get in there in chest waders. You'll see a little bit in a moment, hopefully my next video at Snowmelt Works. We don't enter the river per se at Snowmelt. But we use some of the same instrument, instrument techniques and research through the university that are done by the Minnesota DNR and the um, US Geological Survey to measure how deep the water is, what the volume of water flowing in the river is, some of the chemical properties such as is water temperature and thinking related to what's dissolved in the water. We also use um, this technique where we have this really machine that, I mean, in some ways they look like R2-D2 if you're a Star Wars fan, but this is an automatic sampler that has a pump in the top and a carousel of bottles um, underneath it. And what it allows us to do is program that this sips water out of the river, say every day or every 12 hours. 
And this allows us to get samples like this where we can analyze that chemical flavor and look at what's happening for the landscape contributions to water over time. Let's see. And one important way um, to think about the really charismatic changes that can happen is over spring in northern Minnesota, we often have snow that melts and sometimes we get some melt and some reaccumulation. So what you're seeing happening on my screen here is a time lapse video. Um, we aim cameras at the stream and so we have kind of a consistent measurement rod that you see in the center and you can see the river on the right has experienced some snow melt, so the water gets deeper. You can see some rain coming in. The stream level is going up. The bits of snow and ice and frozen um, portions of water seem to be going away. The water is really going up. It's out of its banks. It's coming onto the onto the floodplain area, and we have this entire sort of cycle play out over spring every year. And some of our questions relate to what waters make up that river as our watershed melts and starts to become connected in the below ground system. And what are the sensitivities to how that river behaves with changes in landscape, changes in weather and climate, et cetera. So we have a time-lapse video looking at the screen. We can also, compare images. So thinking about a small stream that contributes right into that area we just saw the video on, um, we know that there are very dynamic differences. And so when melt is happening, there's not just water, but a lot of sediment, potential for eroded material also moving and contributing to the stream. And so what we see is sort of late in May, I am standing sort of center in the photograph in my field gear clothes, and the small contributing stream is, is about ankle deep. But this down tree that's above my shoulder when I'm kind of standing at ground level, to the right, looking on top of it, has evidence that sediment has moved sort of in this overland flow path during that um, snow melt kind of wet up period. So one of the things we're interested in is this a disproportionate time of connection between the landscape and the stream and how might the sediment movement change um, with changes in land cover. So as we continued to analyze this, what we were able to do is take a series of those data, the um, water samples that came from the auto sampler where we were able to look say daily across that wet up sequence and be able to look at the chemical flavors of the water. So some of the, the punchline um, of this research, I have fancy graphs here on the right that are currently in re-review within um, the Journal of Hydrology. But among friends, the punchline is there is an evolution and a change to the chemistry or the flavor of water that we're seeing coming down the river as we go from snow through the melt, through the wet up sequence into summer. What we are seeing at the beginning is actually a higher contribution from say groundwater aquifer sources forming that underground flow path to the stream and river. And as snow melts and we have less and less snow depth, we're going forward into spring, our landscape is thawing. We are seeing more of those contributions from the wetlands and from the soil layers come in. And so we're noticing this um, really intriguing chemical pattern to try and think about what happens as our systems wet up in spring. In the bigger picture, this uh, chemical flavor work is also a part of thinking about what happens on the landscape with harvest and any sort of disturbance that might happen in a forest ecosystem. For example, uh, a pathogen defoliation or trees losing their leaves because of some pest. And so the larger um, body of work allows us to think about what happens with kind of the type of timber management operations that are happening um, 
on lands such as UPM Blandon lands um, in North Central Minnesota right now. And what our work has shown is in some cases, there is, there is erosion associated very locally with harvest areas on the land. Measures of sediment in the streams sometimes show some increase, um, but those are often very local in time and space. There are other measures of water accounting that we look at in terms of how much water is exiting our watershed per year or the annual water yield. What we're seeing is that in over the long run, over decades, these are showing some resiliency. Where we are seeing changes with harvest data is that sometimes that biggest storm of the year can become a little sensitive. We used to think that that biggest flow event of the year, like the one you saw the video of, was always associated with snowmelt. But what we're finding is that sometimes those snowmelt dynamics might be experiencing some change. And when we're comparing a harvested and an unharvested basin, even if they're right next door to each other, they might not be having the same peak stream flow from the same event. One may be peaking with snowmelt and the other may be peaking with a more severe summer rainstorm type um, event. Big piece of the puzzle that's really important in Minnesota um, and sort of these Great Lakes area landscapes is that this water stored in the landscape is important. We have wetlands, we have deep soils. These are um, basically setting up our landscapes to be like a big sponge that can hold a lot of water. And so in some ways, these provide a bit of a buffer um, when we think about the effects of what's going on on the landscape being seen in the stream, maybe right away and for long periods of time. And so this component of soil water storage is incredibly important. So when we think about what's going on on the landscape with management, we also need to be thinking about water, what water is doing in the landscape itself. So I know I put a lot of science out here in the past, say, 15 minutes. Um, if I could leave you with just a few nuggets, and then I'm happy to talk a lot more about any of this, um, and we'll talk about what you can do. The takeaways to take from the science, streams and rivers, particularly in our Great Lakes region, are quite strongly linked to their surrounding watersheds. We can't... Um, you have to think about that whole unit, that whole watershed that has the landscape, the below ground, and the surface water body. Forests tend to be associated with high quality surface waters. Um, this phenomenon has actually been studied for centuries um, and is hugely important to water supplies um, for societies. This connection that exists that keeps this forest water quality high is both on and below that land surface. Scientific studies often quantify these links. Scientists use many different tools that help us understand why forests are so linked with high water quality. Um, we want to understand why and what are the mechanisms actually at play there to predict what might happen in the future. Um, forests grow and change, climate is changing, and we wanna maintain these high quality waters moving forward, hence wanting to know the mechanism behind it. So thank you so much for helping me um, talk science. And now I have just a few thoughts on what to do. And then I would actually really love for us to have a longer conversation um, so I can hear what you're thinking on landscapes yourself. So thinking about what happens in these northern Minnesota landscapes, allow that infiltration to occur when you have that option. Keep that connection from the surface, from the rain and snow that can filter into the ground. Consider if you're it, um, at all thinking about, about water not running off your landscape, consider water storage. Clearly that can happen in soils. Um, Snow is even seasonal water storage. Um, I and several others have rain barrels to think about using water for gardens that would already be kind of entering my landscape. Um, 
and another big call is to keep keep supporting science, keep showing up to discussion webinars such as this, maintain an interest, observe water in the world, ask questions. Um, I'd like to point out that scientists, so these were members of my group after a long hard day instrumenting that site on the West Swan River, we're people too, we love our work, we love water and nature, and we're really keen to be able to talk about it. Um, we haven't observed every patch of Minnesota yet in Minnesota waters, let alone everywhere else. So um, we love thinking and talking about this. Um, science is a team sport. I have to acknowledge several members of my group, including um, both Zach McCachran and Ethan Pulowski, who excitedly over the past half a dozen years have earned PhDs in this program at the University of Minnesota. Um, and this has been some of the studies that they've done. We've received funding from the Minnesota LCCMR, support from the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement, continued support from the University of Minnesota and Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, and again, none of this science in my mind is definitely a team sport. So we love experiencing the environment, using our lens to observe it, and most importantly, talking about it with people. So Bill, I think I've left plenty of time for questions in terms of tips of what to do. That can be a great ongoing conversation. Um, and I'll push it back to you. All right, Diana, thank you very much. That was absolutely outstanding and fascinating. I'd like to bring in now the Tasca Waters board member and manager of the Tasca County's AIS program, Bill Granges, for the Q&A section. Bill, all yours. Thank you, Brian. And welcome everyone to the Q&A section of this program. Remember to submit your questions in writing by using the Q&A icon. Don't use the chat function. Now I'll read the questions out loud and they will be answered by Diana. Now we might combine some similar questions and some of the questions we've gotten in have already been answered. So we also might not get to all of your questions. And if we don't, please feel free to email us so we can send you that information after the program. All right, let me get to technology. Okay, our first question for Diana is, does the composition of the forest, mostly conifer, mostly deciduous, mostly shrubs or mixed, make a difference? Yes, uh, I would say yes. Thank you for that question. It can make a difference. And there's a few kind of different ways that I'll start with. And then if I'm not hitting the mark or you have follow-up questions, like I encourage you to, to keep, keep asking along. So there are some really important kind of amount of water pieces to think about with the forest composition. And sitting um, in Minnesota, I'm like, Physically, I'm sitting in St. Paul. I spend a lot of time in Northern Minnesota in areas around Grand Rapids, around Lutzen, around Grand Marais. And thinking about if you're in a conifer dominated forest, for the most part, so larch are a little bit of an exception, but those conifers have their needles or their leaves on them all year round. And so they're growing, they're transpiring water, meaning they're taking water out of the ground and sending it back to the atmosphere um, as water vapor all year round compared to the deciduous trees, which only have their leaves on them and kind of do that water function of taking water out of the ground and sending it back to the atmosphere during the growing season. And so when we go to look at this annual level of what the water outputs are of a watershed, and that ET can be higher coming out of these conifer dominated watersheds. That might mean, and that can mean often, there's this trade off going on that there could be lower flow in the streams and rivers because there's only so much water to go around in many of these systems. And if it's going out to the atmosphere as ET, there could be less of it going to the streams and rivers. That's one sort of like baseline answer to that. Mm. There is some really cool science. Um, I know colleagues of mine in particular that are really interested in this, that look at, at the species level, how those tree roots develop and how those tree roots situate themselves in the below ground space. We're not sure these trees are even drinking from the same below ground water pools. This is really cool. And so thinking about different tree rooting strategies, trees may set themselves up 
to do their best job competing to get that water from below ground. So when we look at the annual water balance, there are some differences, but when we look tree to tree, there are some really just amazing um, evolutionary strategies that different trees undergo. And so you sure. may experience walking in the woods, walking in more like wet woods versus, versus upland drier woods that you see different tree species kind of tending to do well on different sites. And so the, this is part of some of this mapping of, of trees succeeding, um, doing their best work in the environments where they are. Some of that really deals with their water strategies. Wonderful, thank you for that answer. Um, your wish is coming true. We have questions just flowing in here. Um, any recommendations on forest buffer widths or best practices along streams and areas undergoing timber harvest? In areas undergoing timber harvest. So I would say um, the Minnesota Forest Practices has some guidelines. And these guidelines really are based on kind of like a straight line distance for a consistent mm -hmm. with buffer. This can be one strategy to undergo. I like to make sure we're thinking about the landscape itself as well, because what's important to me is not just thinking about the amount, but thinking about the function. I really think about the function. And so if those trees are um, in a floodplain area where you see the water coming up and flowing over onto the landscape, you know, there's some opportunity there for that forest floodplain buffer to have some, you know, watershed function to it. That mm -hmm. may be a bit different than if it's, if it's a bluff where it's much, much higher. Um, I encourage folks to like, you know, get the, you can get in touch with me offline if you don't have the forest practices guideline handbook. I took my little picture of it out of here. Um, the Forest Resource Council is a great, um, a great source for information on this. And what I can say is there has been research data um, that was about a decade or so ago now that was very close to, to your uh, home base in Grand Rapids, where there were different studies done that were looking at saying different buffer widths and whether getting into kind of the forest ops of mm -hmm. what is that buffer? Is it an equipment exclusion zone? Is it a no harvest zone? Meaning does it stay totally and completely intact? Or does it just mean that the equipment can't enter it, but they can reach and pick trees out of it? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the punchline of that research showed some resiliency there for um, the Pokegama area study sites where this was conducted. So I bring that up if you have local, um, if we have local participants on this call from the Grand Rapids area, they may be familiar. We do, we do. Yes. Yeah um some of that research and so these forests are, are are pretty resilient okay very good um next question is it collected on specific bodies of water available to the public and if so where do we find it where do you find it okay bits and pieces here so this is one of those it depends um answers so work that's collected by agencies um, gets kind of published and brought out through those agencies. So USGS, Minnesota DNR, um, their work and often work that's kind of funded by them, that's all within the public domain and you have to kind of find it through their data portals, which may seem like it, it you know, takes an advanced degree in web sleuthing out where the data is. That's one part. Secondly, um, work that's done in academia, there's a couple of ways. One, oftentimes there's a little bit of a holding time so like there's a delay in making some of this public because students are using it for their theses and we're working on it to um, publish scientific journal papers that have to go through the scientific um, peer review process that takes time and so that data kind of like for better or worse ends up in those publications and then oftentimes will be residing either within kind of the Minnesota library system where it's public. Sometimes now there's more emphasis on those publications being open access. So you don't have to have like a university identity to be able to access it through libraries. They can be like searched through Google or available if you search through scholar.google.com through Google the Google Scholar engine. There is another move 
to make hydrology data. And this is nationally um, searchable, discoverable, and open. So there is a group called Quasi or, hang on, the cons it's going to be a long acronym, C-U-A-H-S-I, and I can like get this out to everyone um, um, through Itasca Waters afterwards. Thanks. And what they're putting together is some like map searchable portals where scientists are providing their like quality controlled, quality assured data across, um, it's a uh, U.S., they get funding from the National Science Foundation. So it's a U.S. based mm -hmm. primarily institution, but to make that free and searchable as well. Specifically, um, some of the stuff I've done that's collected with funding from the LCCMR, go, mm -hmm. the final data is in those LCCMR reports, which I believe should be open through the state, but admittedly, I haven't checked that. Okay, very good. All right, next question. That was a big one. Um, the Deer Lake Pacagama water quality study showed phosphate running off of our land to the lake. The water runs from the highway ditch to a cedar wetland to the lake. The plants tend to absorb phosphates and the decayed plant material tends to release phosphates to the lake. Mm -hmm. Question, is there anything that we can add that ties up more phosphates to reduce the phosphate flow into Deer Lake? Okay, admittedly, phosphorus is a, is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually have work not in such uh, vegetated, pristine areas, but in some of the more dairy farm areas that drain to Green Bay, where we're looking very specifically at um, kind of what's the what with phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, and so phosphorus binding... It's tricky business because it depends on some environmental conditions as well. And so sediments, particularly sediments that would have like a, a lot of space to absorb from, I guess. So thinking about like if you have some sort of spill and you want to put absorbent on something, right? You want a, a sediment that has a lot of absorptive capacity to it. What we find in wetlands and in in some stream systems is that those sediments actually bind and hold the phosphorus. But for those reactions to happen, you need to be kind of in a sweet spot of, of a chemical environment. And so it's kind of hard for me to give like a specific tailored example um, mm -hmm. to a site mm -hmm. without thinking about it, you know, without some of the particulars. But I would say often wetlands are used you know, things where you're slowing down the water. So if you have soils, uh, wetland plants, you're kind of adding contact time for those mm -hmm. phosphorus reactions to happen. That can be one thing to consider. Um, or I guess I'm happy to think offline if there's some other, sure. like other bodies of studies to point you to. Um, Cause this is a big thing, not just in, yeah. you know, like how to get phosphorus out of waters is uh, this is a thing um, for all of us, especially in aquatic invasive species too. Um, is there a role for volunteers in some of the monitoring work? Some of the monitoring work, I mean, it, absolutely. There's often a role for volunteers. Some of the monitoring work I've done. We haven't done our best with the stuff I've presented here. We were working on lands where we worked quite a bit um, with the with the land manager, which was UPM Blandin. And so we were having conversations for them because it's wonderful when folks are out using these lands and they have like eyes on things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Anecdotally, I'm a I'm a part of another project that's getting going here in the Twin Cities, where we're looking at the water related and hydrologic function of trees and city parks. And so we have a lot of monitoring equipment out that's in various parks around the city of St. Paul. And we've really appreciated the eyes on the the eyes on the trees there because we mm -hmm. have a you know, a QR code set up similar to what I think you guys use at Itasca Waters. You take a picture of the of the black and white code. And then they can email us and we've had just a great response of like, hey, this blew over in the storm last night. Yeah. So that's a piece of it. 
I know on the weather side, there are other great opportunities for sort of for monitoring and citizen science. Um, so yeah, definitely yeah. some opportunities linked particularly to my research. I haven't had that quite yet. Okay. I think with AIS and some of the uh, some of the more aquatic species monitoring too, they've had really good collaborations and others would be able to talk more about that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, next question. For watershed level planning, do you have any input for recommendations or considerations related to forest management? More generally, how could your research data influence decision-making by county, state, or federal forestry departments? Yes, and so admittedly, I, I began my position, so my, you know, my day job, so to speak, is as the hydrologist in the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota. And I have been getting a series of questions about what's thrown out in the planning world is the two thirds rule. And so what this has um, been developed in the state is when we think about, and I'm gonna use air quotes here, watershed level, and we'll kind of come back to that, but thinking about how much of a watershed could be harvested or in that like kind of just harvested regenerating early growth phase following a harvest kind of at any given time and there has been a lot of work in planning um i know particular at the state level i think this goes down to the county level and sub sub county levels thinking about as these watersheds are organized mm -hmm. develop that landscape patchwork of how much harvest has taken place what we're seeing is when we think about that lens with some of the data we're seeing here kind of regionally is that that water storage below ground is an important key. So what we may need to um, conversations to prompt may be thinking back at that. So how do we not just incorporate the above ground, um, what's going on with the growing forest, but also think about, you know, how deep are those soils? How much of this is wetlands? Um, and so this is coming out not just um, in thinking about the harvest and the management, management, excuse me, but uh, about fire and fire susceptibility. Um, so something uh, a PhD, former PhD student now actually working with flood prediction um, at a federal agency, a hydrologist mm -hmm. that worked with mm -hmm. me. His, we've been doing some time series analysis um, following the Pokegama fire now that that was you know over a decade ago to be able to look at what's going on with the stream flows coming out of there. And we're seeing a story develop that's just because so much of it is wetland and so much of the area was forest mm. that burned that went back to forest. Um, that there's a lot of resiliency there in the hydrology and it's because of this below ground storage. And so what conversations I'd love to have with planners um, goes to how do we think about not just what's growing out of the ground, but also what's that capacity below it. Mm. Very good. I think we're gonna loop back around to the uh, Deer Lake study again, Deer Lake Pekegum study. Is biochar a viable option to filter water in a scenario like the Deer Lake uh, Pekegum Lake study? Um, I know that there's some interest in this. I, I don't have like direct knowledge. I haven't done biochar studies, mm -hmm. but I know from what I know reading papers, like it's promising. Okay. or it seems promising because again that biochar if we're in that right sweet spot of chemical environment is something that can sorb a lot mm -hmm. okay um so promising but i don't know you know i don't to, have the direct knowledge to be continued okay um next question boy this is great the amount of questions we're getting here um, how can my of lake shore and my daily activities on that lake shore compared to the large land levels you talked about today? Yeah, so asking to put your sort of um, individual size family lake shore parcel there. Yeah, and so your your piece 
of the landscape doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's part of a larger patchwork. And so there is one, excuse me, some recognition of where that sits, that maybe if you're on the lake shore, lake shore, you're in that special sort of land to water interface zone. And thinking about making sure what you're doing on your lake shore um, would be maybe providing a buffer for not having a lot of overland flow erosion that could be washing down if you're primarily, you know, if your parcel is surrounded by, by forest and vegetated area. Um, be aware of what's going on under your property. And so it's it's a very different level of planning, but to think about, you know, if you're on a septic system, making sure that that is um, on the up and up um, and not providing any below ground contributions. Um, and thinking about some of these general kind of water balance, water holding, not disproportionately contributing if you're kind of that, um, you're right on the edge. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being distracted with some of these questions that are coming in, trying to read them and prioritize, which is tougher today. Um, okay, uh, well, what kind of impact would a timber harvest have on lowland forest types, such as uh, the brass spruce, uh, black spruce peatlands, having chemistry and hydrology of streams and rivers within that watershed. Sure. And so one of the um, one of the special considerations in this region, a lot of times what happens is those black spruce lowlands are harvested in the winter and they're done under a concrete frost, which is kind of a, a special subset condition when that ground is literally quite frozen. And that is done in order to minimize the effects on hydrology and kind of watershed um, watershed related conditions because what's happening is that ground is sort of frozen so solid you can drive on it concrete frost and it's kind of remaining in place and so some of the best management practices and the guidelines that have been developed in the state were done for the the purposes of minimizing the hydrology bigger picture it's thinking about you know the expanse and what's what's um you know what's following the harvest so to say is it is it becoming a black spruce forest again and so it's a cycle that's continuing versus you know a harvest and in, in some sort of conversion if that would be happening um for thinking about that water balance as a whole but i can say the the bmps developed were really done to minimize those conditions. And something that's happening and may require some conversation and revisiting as the number of like concrete frost days, mm -hmm. sort of like that, how much of the year that condition occupies mm -hmm. um, may be changing. I see. Okay. Um, Jan, I'm gonna skip down. Um, um, Jan is helping me with these things. This, it's just, I just love the way it was written. Um, <laughs> capital letters, help, exclamation point, exclamation point. Um, but this is a really good point. From one of the freshwater stewards in Ramsey County, Washington County, Metro Watershed District, uh -huh. uh, about trees and phosphorus. Um, I guess this is more directed also at, at, at us here as the program. Please let us know the opportunities with the research in the Twin Cities. I'd like to stay in touch and engage across our tree care advisors program with the University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardener as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I can say some of the programs in the in the Twin Cities and talking more with the tree care advisory group is there's a few of us myself and a colleague um, in civil environmental geoengineering, Dr. Shui Fang, where we're really starting to look at the forests and trees within the city. And we've gotten some new funding from the urban stormwater community to try and look at trees and not just water, but also some of the chemical flux balance there too. And mm -hmm. so I don't know, there may be some um, I would say there are definitely opportunities. We're talking more to try and bridge these communities. I feel like sometimes, you know, there's the forest community focused on land and on the trees, and then there's the water community. And so myself and others are trying to form these bridges between mm -hmm. those communities to, to think more holistically about these systems. 
Very good. I'm keeping an eye on the time here too. Um, what about the impact of various types of mining? Yeah, and so this this can come up quite a bit in northern Minnesota, and I have to say I actually haven't done any mining work. Um, so I don't have any, how do I put this, information and knowledge with my scientist hat on. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, next question. Can you tell me a bit more about how can I, as a private woodlot, Mm -hmm. or waterfront owner manage my land to not harm the water mm -hmm. that's kind of similar to the ones that we've had above but yeah well and so here's i this is where i encourage you to how do i put it like think and be open um because there sadly is not a one size fit all because you're managing your woodlot or your your woodlot on lakefront property, you know, you're, you're managing your property for like a suite of many things. And so it's thinking about kind of maintaining that balance of when rain and snow come in, where they go to. Um, and having that in mind, like as one of your many objectives. And so you might want to consider certain options for that forest management that may keep a certain stocking density of forests that keep a certain character of forest, a certain openness, you're managing it for habitat, water, um, recreation, pleasure, all of these different considerations. And so it's thinking critically about keeping those water inputs, outputs sort of in balance um, is what I would start with. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think to keep things moving along here and keep to the lunch hour, I think we'll cut the questions there. Uh, again, if we haven't gotten to your questions, please do send us an email. Um, Diana, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna turn this back around now to Steph. Steph, I'm so, <laughs> wow, sorry, to Brian. Sorry, Brian. Brian, take it away, please. That's okay. <laughs> Bad. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, Diana. That's our that concludes our program for today. Uh, great, great work, Diana, on all the stuff that you revealed to us today. I hope you guys on um, the receiving end enjoyed the seventh 2022 program in the Tasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. I want to thank again Dr. Diana Carwin for today's program. We thank Bill Granches for hosting the QA portion. And thanks to Atasca Waters board member Jan Sandberg for handling all the background work with the questions. And most importantly, we thank you for having an interest in clean water and taking the time to be here today. A big tip of the hat goes to the Atasca Waters Education Committee and its partners for all they've done to produce today's program and those throughout 2022. Today's program was recorded and will soon be available on our website, atascawaters.org. Reminder that we will be emailing you an evaluation. We hope that you use it to give Atasca Waters the feedback we need to make those to make these programs even better in 2023. Or you can just use uh, your computer to click on the link or your, whatever you're watching uh, this program through. Just click on the link to submit your evaluation. Our next live program will be at noon on November the 3rd entitled Chloride Effects on Our Water Resources and Ecosystem, What We Can Do About It. You can sign up now by going to our website at taskawaters.org. I'm Brian Whittemore. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you on November 3rd.